I mean, right there is the essence of it. God says, I'm never, ever, he says, I will never break my covenant with you, but you're breaking your covenant with me. So here's the question. Will God unconditionally love the people even though they disobeyed him? Or will he punish them and, and disavow them and destroy them because he's disobeyed him? In other words, is the covenant that God made with the children of Israel conditional or unconditional? Is it one of unconditional love or is it conditioned on their obedience? So we're looking at the gospel in every single book of the Bible. Uh, we're looking at each book of the Bible and asking, what is this about? What is this book about? And then secondly, how does this book contribute to the storyline of the Bible? How does it move the storyline along? Number three, how does it point to the gospel of grace? And lastly, how does it point to Jesus himself? So now we get to the book of Judges. And <laughs> um, the book of Judges comes after the uh, conquest, that is to say, after the children of Israel had moved into the promised land and they had uh, taken it up as their, as their land and they had developed a society. And as we have said, all the way from the book of Genesis to here, the thing that has driven the biblical storyline is the promise to Abraham that his descendants would become a great nation, they would own the land and therefore become a, a, an actual society, and that they would be a witness to the nations by the way in which they, uh, they'd be a witness to the glory of God by the way in which they lived in, in that land. And up until the end of the book of Joshua, it looks great. We have God fulfilling his promises. Uh, he um, brings them out of Egypt. He, he grows them into a great nation in Egypt. He brings them out of Egypt in Exodus. He gives them the law and the tabernacle. He gives them the law that they have to obey and the tabernacle with the sacrifices for uh, forgiveness when they disobey. He brings them uh, through the wilderness. Uh, an entire generation dies off because they're really unwilling to go into the promised land and take it. But the second generation goes in. They're given uh, a final uh, statement from Moses about how to live there. Uh, Joshua leads them in pretty successfully, and that's how the book of Joshua ends. It looks like, hey, we did it. The, the promises have been fulfilled. Looks like uh, salvation is around the corner because the, the, the world is going to see who God is, and the whole world is going to turn to God because of the way in which Israel lives in the land. And the book of Judges starts a whole new series, I believe, a whole new chapter in the, in the storyline of the Bible. Josh, Judges, uh, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles uh, shows that no, the children of Israel are not going to live the way they should in the land. They are not going to be able to actually be the witness to the nations that they should be. Now it starts here in the book of Judges because the book of Judges can be outlined as a series of cycles of decline, revival, and then deeper decline and revival, and then deeper decline and revival. That's how you can understand it. In fact, you, you, you could outward, you could outline the book of Judges by verses one to three talks about the cycle. And then after that, it goes through these cycles from chapters four to 16, and then 17 to 21, I'll get to it in a minute. It shows how, how, how deeply um, the uh, children of Israel had declined uh, spiritually in the land that they were supposed to take possession of and build a God-honoring society. Um, every time uh, the children of Israel fall into idolatry, then that leads to a kind of slavery. Then they cry out and God sends them a judge or a deliverer, a savior, who saves them. But then after that, they go into an even deeper decline. And this happens through a whole series of, uh, of judges, Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah and Barak, uh, Abimelech, Tola, Jer, Jerim, Gideon, uh, Elon, Ibzon, Abdon, uh, Samson. There's a whole slew of these people. And in the beginning, Othniel, for example, and Deborah are particularly good judges. 
But as, the, as you go along, you'll see that every time that there's a, a, a idolatry, slavery, decline, crying out, a revival with a, with a deliverer, every time the deliverer gets more and more flawed. When you get to Jephthah, when you get to Samson, Samson's a mess, and I won't go into it in much more detail. I mean, he's famous, of course, because of his strength, but read him. He is an absolute mess. And so what's happening is, all through the book of Judges, is it's becoming very, very clear that something else is going to have to happen or Israel is just going to be a complete failure. Uh, the, the, there's two places where the book of Judges uh, says this. Judges chapter 17 and chapter 21 says, um, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And what was say, it's saying is people were not going to follow the law of God uh, the way they were living in Israel at that time, which was tribally, which was uh, without a central monarchy, without a central king. And so the book of Judges is saying we're going to have to get something because otherwise uh, the people are just going to keep declining into greater, greater sin, paganism, idolatry, etc. So uh, Judges is the beginning of a new part of the, of the Bible in which it says unless there's some kind of divine intervention, there's no way that the promise is going to be fulfilled, that Israel will be a light to the nations and Israel will be able to bring salvation. Um, uh, it's interesting, by the way, that the biblical storyline is really driven ahead, not only through Judges, but through the rest of the, um, of the next few books, by a, by a tension that is perfectly put together in Judges chapter 2, verse 1, where God says, I will never break my covenant with you, Yet you have disobeyed me. And then he says, why have you done this? Now I will not drive the people out before you, and they will become snares for you. I mean, right there is the essence of it. God says, I'm never, ever, he says, I will never break my covenant with you. But you're breaking your covenant with me. So here's the question. Will God unconditionally love the people, even though they disobeyed him? Or will he punish them and, and disavow them and destroy them because he's disobeyed them? In other words, is the covenant that God made with the children of Israel conditional or unconditional? Is it one of unconditional love or is it conditioned on their obedience? And what's interesting is the book of Judges never resolves that question. And as we're going to see, it's not resolved throughout the rest of the Old Testament. It's very easy to say, well, God basically just loves us. That's the liberal view. Or some people say, no, no, unless you obey, God is going to destroy you. That's the conservative view. But the book of Judges does not take the liberal or the conservative view. In fact, the rest of the Old Testament leaves us in a lot of tension. Is the covenant conditional, meaning you have to obey, or is it unconditional, meaning God's just going to love us anyway? And that answer is never given until we get to the cross we actually see that Jesus Christ obeyed God, fulfilled the covenant perfectly so that God could love us unconditionally. So it starts right here and Judges you know, begins a new chapter. Uh, let me just talk about, as we've already talked in a way about the principle of grace, because if you take a look at Samson and Jephthah, all these, all these, Gideon even, Gideon is kind of a wreck too, he's good and bad. Basically, what you see is this. Here's, a, here's a, to me, a theme of, of Judges. God relentlessly offers his grace to people who do not deserve it, who do not seek it, and never appreciate it even after they've been saved by it. I mean, you see that again and again in the book of Judges. So it really is pointing forward to God's grace, even though it doesn't really explain how God can be so gracious to us. If he's a holy God, how can he do that? It's never resolved in the book of Judges. But here's the other thing to say. Two things. When you get to the very end of the book of Judges, it says, to, it, it gives you a terrible, terrible um, story. It's, a, there's, it's about a, a, a Levite who has a concubine, which is a second class wife, frankly. And he's in a town, and the people come and try to, uh, the, the nasty people in the town, uh, and this is a town, I guess, in the tribe of in the Benjamin. They come and they try to uh, rape him. And what he does is he sends his wife outside so they can rape her. And they rape her and they kill her. And when he finds her dead the next morning, he goes home. 
He cuts her into pieces, sends them to all the other 12, 12 tribes and says, look at what a horrible thing has been done. Uh, and all the other tribes, uh, they, they, there's a civil war between Benjamin and the rest of the uh, children of Israel. But you know, the Levite doesn't explain how he sacrificed his wife to save his own skin. And it's just a terrible ending. And it's, it's the way the book of Judges ends. And it's really, and then it finally says, there was no king in Israel, everybody did what was right, right in his own eyes. And what it was saying is, look how bad things are. Unless we get a king, we're never really going to be okay. But of course, we know that even after God gives them a king, that won't be enough either. We're going to have to have a greater king, which is Jesus himself. So there's a sense in which Judges is pointing to Jesus, the great king. But let me just suggest one other thing. When you read the end of Judges and you say, why in the world is this even in the Bible? This is terrible. This man sacrifices his wife to save his skin and then uses her as an excuse for a civil war. This is just terrible. How can you, when you look at, he's such a terrible husband, how can you not think about the, the true husband, Jesus Christ? He didn't sacrifice us in order to save his skin. He sacrificed his skin in order to save us. Jesus is the true husband that the terrible husband at the end of the book of Judges points to. Jesus is the real judge, the real deliverer that the bad deliverers like Samson and, uh, and Jephthah point to. Uh, and the good, the good deliverers like Deborah and Othniel point to. He's the true judge, he's the true deliverer, he's the true husband, he's the true king. And without him, there is no hope. And that's what the book of Judges says. And yet there's plenty of hope because we have Jesus Christ. So Judges is pointing forward to that, and that's good news.